I've been doing quite a lot of hard edge modelling recently. My Space Marine sculpture that I've recently completed was largely comprised of 3D printed parts with a bit of scratch building thrown in here and there. It did have some sculpted elements in it as well, but I felt the need to get back to a pure sculpture. So as you can see, we've got an orc character here, uh, which I've sculpted up in monster clay. Uh, so in this video, I'm going to go through that sculpting process. We're also going to mould and cast the piece and then finally paint it. I was inspired to do this by a chap called Stuart Bray, who I believe is a professional makeup artist in the film industry. Uh, he has some videos on his channel where he goes through sculpting and detailing some prosthetic makeup pieces. Uh, he sculpts them in clay, and one of the key things he has to do as part of his process involves using reticulated sponges to put texture into the clay. Now these are commonly used as filters for aquariums, so I ordered a few from Amazon to have a go. And actually I've got to say I quite like them, so um, in this video we're going to be going through doing the sculpture but I'm going to be paying particular attention to texture in this video and really put a lot of effort into getting a lot of skin textures into the sculpture um, and instead of using solvents to smooth out the clay as I have done on numerous sculptures previously I instead want to use these sponges to smooth out the clay and also to apply texture. So I've started off with the monster clay in the microwave and I've softened it up to a very soft consistency and I'm just building up a basic shape of the sculpture over my armature. Another rule that I set myself for this sculpture was that I wasn't going to use any found objects, it was all going to be purely sculpted. So what I'm doing is smoothing out some lumps of clay on a layer of tin foil, and what I'm hoping to do is transfer the texture from the tin foil into the clay. So once this is moulded and cast, I can then paint that up and hopefully it should look like sort of battered metal. So I'm just blocking out the basic shapes of how this will look. I'll be adding a few additional armour pieces later on, but this is just to give me a basic idea of how the sculpture will look. Orc and goblin type fancy creatures often have quite craggy uh, features so it gives me a lot of opportunity to put some interesting texture detail in. So I'm just continuing to build up the basic shapes of the face and I'm using brakes to smooth out the clay as I go. These glass eyes won't be the final ones in the piece but I do find having some realistic looking eyes in the sculpture as you work really does help you visualise the character. It can actually be quite useful to use animal eyes in um, characters like this because they tend to look a little bit more fierce and obviously a little bit inhuman so that really adds to the character. I did have to rework this a few times actually. When I initially started sculpting it, I started seeing Lead and Nimoy in the sculpture um, in his sort of Spock makeup. And a few people on Instagram did actually comment that they could see uh, Jean Luc Picard, uh, Patrick Stewart. So um, I think people do tend to bring to it whatever happens to be on their mind, but it certainly had a little bit of a Star Trek thing going on. Um, so I just wanted to avoid comparisons of any sort of known characters. I mean, obviously it's an orc, so it's a fairly standard fancy character, but I didn't want it to look like any particular actor. So I've got the basic shape of the sculpture blocked out, so I'm now starting to come in and add some texture detail. So for the cheeks near the nose, I'm adding in some sort of slightly stretched pore detail just by stabbing in with the end of my sculpting tool. And for the nose, I'm using a ball tool to put some pores in. For all these, I'm smoothing it down with the sponge, and I actually find that quite useful. It sort of adds a degree of texture as you um, wipe on the clay with it, but it also smooths out the um, shapes as well. And to be honest, I didn't think this would work that well. I was sort of thinking it would leave the clay looking quite rough and not that realistic, but actually it turns out that you can smooth it down quite a lot. And the sponges that I've bought actually come in a few different grades, so there's sort of a rough one and then some slightly smoother ones as well. So using these, you can actually smooth it down to quite a significant extent, and that was a bit of a surprise actually, but it's actually really useful, and I have found myself really liking this technique. So for the neck I'm cutting in some long um, gouges with a sculpting tool and I'm just sort of crisscrossing these to make up some sort of wrinkled flesh type textures. I 
And I think that's the one thing I've really learned from this and from a few previous sculptures is that there's a lot of different textures um, to a character. So whereas the neck might have some sort of wrinkled skin, you know, some folds, the uh, nose will have some pore detail, whereas the areas near the nose will have some stretch pore detail where the skin is sort of stretched away. Um, around the eyes, obviously, you will have some wrinkles and things like that. So there's quite a large variety of um, types of skin in a face. So replicating all of those different textures has actually been quite fun and also quite challenging to get them to look natural. And to be honest with you, I still think I need quite a lot of practice in getting this to look natural, but um, it's a good first step, I think. Now, one thing I kept finding with this was that you couldn't really see much of the detail in the video. Uh, but if I change the light source here, you can suddenly start seeing how much texture there actually is in the sculpture. Now this sculpture is actually relatively large, it's something like two-thirds scale I suppose, so it's quite a large piece. So as you can imagine this took a little bit of time to fully texture the whole thing. But that's fine by me, I actually think doing the texture is one of the more fun elements of doing a sculpture, so it's a fun process doing the whole thing. So this is another technique I actually picked up from one of Stuart's uh, videos and this is a way to add sort of pimples or goosebumps on a neck. Um, so as you can see what I've done is to stick a needle um, ended tool into the clay and just sort of raise it up by moving the clay with the tool and then coming in with a small silicon tipped um, sculpting tool and just closing off the hole. And I find that adds quite a nice uh, realistic look. And again, it's a question of where you might have these. I suppose you might have them under the chin or on the neck, or maybe on the face, depending on the character. Another technique that I used extensively on the model was to use a layer of cling film, uh, just food wrapping over the sculpture, and then to press in with the reticulated foam. It's quite tough, so when you press it actually adds some texture detail to the clay through the cling film. The cling film just sort of helps soften that detail. So I actually found this was a really good way of adding some quite subtle uh, skin texture detail over the entire sculpture. So again, if I move the light, you can more easily see how that texture has been transferred into the clay. And I think that looks really realistic, actually. It does look like skin to me. So yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. And here's a few shots of skin texture in natural light um, when I was making the mold in the workshop. As you can see, there's quite a lot of texture all over this. Um, so yeah, I'm quite pleased with how that came out. So now onto the armour pieces for the sculpture. I wanted to frame the sculpture with a belt and some armour, uh, so that it's got a nice border and natural ends to the piece. And another technique for smoothing out texture detail that I've used on this sculpture, particularly for the belts, was to use a brush just to brush over the uh, details I've cut in. And that helps to smooth them out and adds quite a natural texture, uh, particularly for sort of leather, I found that quite useful. So now onto the moulding process, and this is a technique you've seen me use on numerous uh, sculptures previously. So I'm just pouring small amounts of silicon moulding rubber over the sculpture and letting it drip down. And then using an airbrush and a spatula to push the silicon into the details of the sculpture to make sure I capture all of the information. Now this is quite a large sculpture, so it's a bit of a time consuming process. I'm just doing it in small batches and slowly building it up.
Once I've got the whole thing covered with a detail layer, I can then come in with a thickened batch of silicon and just build that up to give it a bit more strength. So there's my covering of silicon. So what I've done is to build a divide out of aluminium tape and I'm now going to add a layer of fiberglass to this to create a supporting jacket for the mould. Now one thing I have done differently here is often I've used a layer of Vaseline to create a barrier so the two halves of the fiberglass jacket don't stick together. I'm using a slightly different brand of polyester resin to do the fiberglass and I have found that that hasn't worked so well for previous moulds. So what I'm doing here is to cover the first half of the jacket in more aluminium tape and that will provide a nice physical barrier to the two halves of the jacket to stop it sticking together. Let's now dry it so I can now take it off free the sculpture. Now obviously I've got these ears on my sculpture which means I can't just pull the silicon off the sculpture without it breaking and if I didn't cut the mould I wouldn't be able to actually free my cast. So what I'm going to do is cut the silicon from one ear to the other and then have a further dividing line down the back of the neck. Obviously that's more mould separation than I would normally have for a differently shaped piece but there's not really any other way to free this. Um, I should be able to align these back up pretty well though, so the amount of deformation on the back of the cast will only be small. Right, so that's come out pretty easily and the mould's looking pretty good. So I can now put that back into my mould jacket. I'm just going to give that a quick clean up with the Dremel as well, get rid of some of the sharp edges. So I am rotocasting this piece and what that means is you pour in a small amount of resin and then you rotate the mould around and the resin slowly sticks to the inside of the mould as it dries, leaving you with a hollow cast. And what you do is just slowly build that up with several batches. It took me a few um, goes with this uh, to get a decent thickness. And what you can see I'm doing here is just spreading out some of the resin with a spatula. And that's just, just make sure I get a thick edge around the areas I can actually reach. Obviously you need to be quite careful with the bits you can't reach. Um, so you need to put a few batches in to make sure you have a decent thickness for the cast. So there we go, so that's looking pretty good I think. Um, now there is a little bit of a mould line on the back, but that shouldn't be too difficult to remove with a bit of filing and sanding. So now onto painting. The first thing I've done here is to give this a layer of undercoat. Now because I want to slowly build up the colours, um, I didn't want to use a grey undercoat, so I've actually got a white one here. Um, same brand, it's from Halfords if you're in the UK, it's a car primer. Um, but I find this stuff really good, so I've given that a layer. I've noticed in previous projects that spraying straight onto resin, um, the paint doesn't entirely stick to it, so it can come off quite easily. Um, so it's necessary to have a primer on this, I think. So what I'm trying to do is just slowly build up the layers of paint. I want to go for a very realistic look here, so what I'm doing is adding some red and blue on initially to try and give the look of pale skin. I'm assuming all skin is going to work much in the same way that human skin does, so the pigments are largely on the surface and the lower levels of skin still have blood vessels and all the rest of it in there. So what I've done is to give it a red and a blue um, coat, quite a patchy one. You know, I don't want this to look healthy, I want it to look a bit um, ill I suppose, you know. Um, and what I've also started doing, as you can see here, is painting in some blood vessels. Now I suspect most of these probably won't be visible in the final piece, but what I want to have is just some of these to be visible here and there. So it just adds a degree of subtle detail to it, which hopefully will show through in certain places, and hopefully add a degree of realism to the paint job. Now that I've got that in place, I'm now coming in with a layer of flesh pigment, and that's just to try and blend these elements together a little bit more. So we should hopefully have some human-like skin pigmentation, before I come in with the greens to make him a bit more orky. Um, so that's what we're going for here. Something that I've found throughout this project is that the video doesn't really pick up the detail of the sculpture uh, particularly well, uh, whether it be the texture or, or the pigmentation that I'm doing with the uh, paint job. So what I've taken to do is actually taking some stills of this as we go through, just so it's more easy to see what I'm doing in terms of painting. So I'm now just coming in with some light green to start adding a little bit more orkiness into him. 
I think that's quite subtle. So now coming in with a darker green as well to start really uh, bringing in a more green texture to it. Now the airbrush is great for doing sort of subtle uh, variations in colour and adding in quite a delicate paint job but what it isn't so good at is picking out the detail in the sculpture that I've done. So what I'm now going to do is come in with some brown oil paint and basically do a wash on the whole thing and that should seep into all of the details in the sculpture and help bring them out. Now this is just um, regular oil paint, I'm using burnt umber and this is thinned down with uh, paint thinner, so this is uh, white spirit if in the UK, uh, known as mineral spirits in other places as well I think. As you can see as I brush that on it's flowing into all of the texture detail that I've cut in, um, so that should help bring out all of the detail. So not looking too bad there, but I think, I think it's worth just sort of um, showing how the difference in lighting can really affect how this looks. At the minute we're looking at it under fluorescent lights, but if I go outside the workshop, you can see this does look quite different. So it is worth looking in a variety of different lighting styles and also through a camera and to the naked eye uh, to sort of get a gauge on how this is looking. Obviously most people will see this as pictures on the internet, so it is worth paying attention to how it looks on camera, as well as how it looks to the naked eye. So I can now come in with a paintbrush and start picking out all of the other details of this sculpture. Now for the eyes, um, obviously I could use glass eyes here, but I wanted this to be a whole cast piece. So I'm not going to start cutting out the eyes and adding glass eyes in its place. So that does mean I have to have painted eyes, which to be honest often don't look quite as good as glass eyes. Uh, nevertheless, I think we can do okay with this. Now I didn't film myself painting all of the eyes uh, purely because it's quite difficult to do this. So I had to hold it at some awkward angles and so it was quite difficult to actually film. I think once I get some gloss varnish on these, they should look quite good from a distance. Also need to paint his outfit as well, I'm just putting some leather colours on the belt. For the armour, what I want to do is paint it a metallic colour, and then use some latex masking to simulate some chipped paint on there as well. So as you can see, you get quite a nice effect as you pull that way, so that should look quite good. So the next stage of this is for me to add some rust pigments on top, just to make the whole thing look like some battered and beaten metal, like he's been in battle like loads of times and has never bothered cleaning his armour. Now for this I'm using Humbral Weathering Powders, uh, which I've used on previous projects as well. Right, so there we go, there's the final piece. Um, the last stage of this was to just give it a coat of varnish. And that really helped bring it out and really did add a uh, realistic look to it, I think. So yeah, very pleased with that, came out very well. Um, I'm in a bit of a roll with creatures at the minute, so I'm definitely going to be doing some more creature sculptures. And something that I'm going to be doing a little bit more of is making these available to people if they want one. So I'm sort of slowly building up my Etsy store. Um, so if you are interested in getting a copy of this, um, it is available. I'll put a link in the description. So many of my projects are moulded and cast these days that it's very easy for me to run off additional copies if people want one. And people have been asking here or there. So thank you very much for the interest. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be doing a little bit more of this. So keep an eye on the Etsy store and you'll see that slowly grow over the next few months. Um, but for the time being, uh, I think that's it. So thanks Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much for watching. I'll be posting videos on future projects, so if you'd like to keep up with what's going on, please do subscribe. Alternatively, you can visit my website, which is www.thedarkpower.com, or you can find me on Facebook, just search for The Dark Power.